Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service and welcome to our Library Through the Lens live webinar. Since the closure of our libraries and venues, we've been working hard to still connect and engage with you through our Library Through the Lens series of adult programs delivered differently. We had to reimagine how to bring you the author talks that you've grown to expect from us, so thank you for joining us. This evening, we welcome special guest author Josephine Moon, all the way from Noosa whose best-selling contemporary fiction is published internationally and whose books include The Tea Chest, The Chocolate Promise, The Beekeeper's Secret, Three Gold Coins and The Gift of Life and of course The Cake Maker's Wish. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have for Josephine into the chat feed on your screen and I'll ask her these at the end of her talk. Now sit back, grab a cuppa or glass of wine and please welcome Josephine. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you everybody for coming along tonight to come out and see me and visit me in my writing room. I am sitting, um, I'm very lucky to have my own room these days. I didn't for a lot of years. I wrote in very pokey little parts of the house or out in cafes or sitting up in bed or all over the place, but I've been working really hard on creating a beautiful room for myself. And I was telling Tracy that um, when you know, COVID shut everything down and all author events were cancelled and everything was put online, I realised quite quickly that there was going to be a lot of people visiting me in my writing room. So I had been meaning to give the wall behind me a makeover for a very long time. So I went to Bunnings and I got some paint and I painted the wall and that painting behind me had been um, a gift I bought myself on the publication of The Gift of Life a year ago and it had been sitting on the floor in my room. So I thought it was high time that I got my act together and uh, painted the wall and got painting on the wall. And as it turns out, you might be able to tell that the cover of this book actually matches that painting really, really well. So it's a little bit of serendipity there that I bought that painting a year ago and it just all kind of came together. There's also a chandelier above my head because um, beauty is very important to me and I like to have I like to be surrounded by beauty when I write and I like to bring beauty into my writing space if I can. So that's where I'm sitting at the moment in, in my home in the, the Noosa hinterland. Uh, so we are on acreage here and um, we've got horses and we've got goats and cats and dogs and we used to have chickens. Oh, we don't have chickens anymore, sadly. I love the chooks, but um, we had a few too many problems with carpet snakes with the chooks. So we don't have chooks anymore. But uh, I really like it here and there's very often outside my window there a horse wandering by or um, yeah another animal or dog or something. There's usually a dog on the floor in this room with me as well. So welcome to my writing space. It's an honour to have you here and um, it's really lovely that you would take the time out to come and see me. I did joke to Tracy that I think most of Australia will be watching the voice semi-finals right now. So if you are um, Coming here to be with me instead of watching The Voice, I thank you very much. I'm a big fan of The Voice myself, so I will also be catching up on it later. So The, the Cave Maker's Wish is my sixth novel, and I have to say that cover is just so stunning, and I'm so happy it made it there. Originally, there was a, a different cover set for this book, and, um, and I loved it as well. It was beautiful. But I had just something was niggling at me about a month or so later. I emailed back my publisher and I said, I know, I said, I love that first cover and I do, but I really, really think we need to get Cape on, on the cover. And I was really lucky in that she, she jumped on that. She said, Trust you, Joe, I think we should do that. And so they changed it and they came up with this. And it's just so gorgeous. I've had people say that they want to lick the cover and certainly that it makes their mouths water. So I'm, I'm really. I couldn't love it more. I think it's probably my favourite now out of all of my covers. And um, authors don't, was a question that people often ask is how much input do we have into covers? And the answer is technically nothing. We're entitled to no input really at all. Um, it's a big, big deal. Covers are always a massive, um, a massive point of contention inside publishing houses. There can be huge fighting over you know, what to go on the cover because it is the number one marketing tool you have on your book, the number one thing that will grab people's attention. So generally they will come up with the cover, they'll send it to you and say, this is your cover, do you have any thoughts? And um, 
unless you really, really hate the cover, there's really not a lot you can do about it. So yeah, I feel really lucky that in this case, I still, I loved the other cover. I just really felt we needed the cake and we did get the cake. So that was great. So the Cake Maker's Wish is, um, it's set mostly in the Cotswolds in England, but it follows my main character, Olivia Kent and her young son, Darcy, who is seven years old. And when the book opens, Olivia has found herself at a crossroads in life. She is a cake maker in Tasmania, in Richmond in Tasmania, and her ma has died. Her ma is actually uh, biologically her grandmother, but since she lost her own mother at a very, very young age, um, grandma just became ma. So she, is, she was the only mother that she knew. And, you know, she's struggling with that grief and she's feeling very alone and very detached from the rest of the world, really. She's a single mother. The Darcy's father, um, Helg, is in Norway. So he's only ever met his father through the internet. And um, so, yeah, she doesn't have a lot of support going on there. And she happens to stumble across a newspaper article inviting descendants of people from the town of Stonedon in the Cotswolds to return or to come to the village. So to leave their country wherever they are and come to the village and join their village of Stonedon to revive the village. So it's an experimental village revival that is going on. And she sees this and she thinks, well, this is a great opportunity to perhaps find um, any of the last traces of her family tree because her grandma came from Stonedon. So that's her family link. And then because Helg's father is in Norway, they're just that bit or quite a lot closer to where Helg is. So it's an opportunity for Darcy to really get to know his father as well. So it's really her, her main wish is to find find whatever family she has left, failing that to build a new one. So that's her wish when she leaves uh, Australia. When she does get there, however, things are not necessarily exactly how she was hoping they would be. So I thought that I would read you uh, an opening scene from the book to give you a sense of what Olivia has walked into. So this is chapter two. When the three sharp raps sounded on the front door of the cottage, Olivia's and Darcy's fingers were coated with butter and flour. It was 24 hours since they'd arrived in Stonedon and the jet lag was knocking them around, but they were keen to get the apple crumble into the oven so they could head out for a leisurely stroll and explore the village's winding streets. A visitor already, Olivia grinned at Darcy and wiped her hands on a tea towel. She hurried along the narrow hallway from the small kitchen to open the front door. It was barely ajar before an angry voice signalled that this might not be the charming English welcome to the neighbourhood after all. Thief, the elderly woman accused, her finger pointing directly at Olivia's chest. Olivia recoiled in surprise. What? I saw you from my window, the woman hissed, powdered makeup flinting away from her frown lines, her head wrapped tightly in a paisley patterned scarf. Saw what? Don't play innocent with me. I watched you and that boy of yours stealing my apples. Cleaned up the whole lot you did. Olivia's jet lagged mind took a moment to process this. But those apples were rotting on the ground. It's my right to let my apples rot if I choose, the woman said. But they were on our side of the hedgerow. Olivia was genuinely confused. What sort of excuse is that? The woman tapped the toe of her boot on the stone step. I planted them. I prune them, they're my apples. Olivia took a breath and smiled. Could we start this conversation again? She held out her hand. I'm Olivia Kent. My son Darcy and I have just moved here and the woman ignored her outstretched hand. I know who you are. You're one of the imports brought here by that devil dealing Renaissance committee. She made a disgusted noise in her throat. They have sold you a good story but you should know that half the village is livid about this and we don't want you here. Olivia turned this information over in her mind. That's interesting, she said, feeling her nose twitch with concern. I'd like to hear more about that. Perhaps we could have a coffee and talk it through sometime in the next few days. If you last that long. Olivia was rendered momentarily speechless by the woman's audacity, but rallied. 
maybe we could just resolve the apples for now. The apples you stole. Hmm. Well, forgive me, but in Australia, if the fruit is on your side of the fence, it's considered yours. Precisely, which I would expect a convict to say, her neighbour retorted. To her dismay, Olivia burst into slightly hysterical laughter. Give me back my apples, the woman demanded. I'd gladly do that, except that Darcy and I are making apple crumble. Your apples are all chopped up. You are, however, welcome to join us for afternoon tea to help us eat them. The woman's chin quivered and her eyes narrowed. This is not the end of this matter. She spun on her heel and strode away, down the drive, boots crunching over the pebbles. So that is the welcome that Olivia actually walks into when she gets to the other side of the world. And uh, she goes out on, she continues her afternoon, she goes out on a walk with Darcy and she starts to meet some other imports as well. And they start to say similar things to her that um, maybe things aren't quite as cheery and uh, friendly and harmonious as they thought they were. So that's a little bit of a shock for her that she has to deal with. So I wanted to start a little bit with where this book originated. Um, in 2015, I took a trip to the Cotswolds with my dad and my sister and my sister's uh, third child who was 14 months old at the time. And the reason I went was specifically to do research. So I try as much as possible to always do location research. So settings and locations are really important to me. Um, for some writers, they're not. Um, some writers have very, uh, very, very minimal description of places and settings. Uh, but for me, it's a real, uh, I'm such a world builder, you know? I spend a lot of time writing very, or creating very detailed little worlds. So Stoneton itself is um, based on a compilation of villages in the Cotswolds. Usually I do um, use real locations and I will name a lot of, you know, streets and details, put in actual shops, really real businesses and locations and street names. For this particular situation, because I'm not English and I don't live in the Cotswolds, it felt like too, too much of a stretch for me to take a village name it, make it, you know, really real and then populate it with fictional characters. I just didn't feel like I had enough kind of um, authority really to do that. So there's a number of villages in the Cotswolds and they're all gorgeous. And one of them in particular was a place where we stayed and we stayed there for about 10 days, which was actually really wonderful because um, I think when you, when you base yourself in one location, it gives you a chance to start seeing the same people when you walk down the street every day, meeting the same shopkeepers and starting to build those little relationships that start to give you stories within a location. And the people who were living in the house next to us, so these were 17th century, maybe 18th century stone cottages, really gorgeous, you know, very quintessential Cotswold kind of iconic cottages. Um, the person next to us, asked me what I did. And when she found out I was a writer, she said, oh, you should come and meet Terry and Brian. They've lived here their whole life. I said, I'd love to do that because um, more often than not, people will always be your greatest resource when you're looking for stories. And um, so I said, I'd love to see them. And they made me a cup of tea and they invited me over and they regaled me with these incredible stories of life in the village, growing, what it was like to grow up in the village in the 50s. And they were hilarious stories. I wish I'd taken a recorder and actually managed to get their voices on tape. Um, I'm not even sure now whether we had voice recording on our phones back then. Maybe we did, I just didn't know about it. Um, everything changes so fast. But I wrote and wrote and wrote. This was the um, little diary that I took, uh, my UK travel diary where it just, met, I uh, just wrote notes every day. That's the 1st of October, 2015. And I, I went to the back with these guys and I just scribbled and scribbled and scribbled everything I could that they were saying and they were so fabulous. But after a while, their sort of jovial nature and these funny stories that they were um, telling me 
started to get tinged with this sadness and I, they were quickly there. It became really apparent that they were grieving for the village that was no longer there. So in their words, in the 50s, 60s, the village was owned by the Lord and Lady of the Manor and everybody rented their cottages off those people. And so it was a self-sustaining village. Everybody knew everybody else, everybody, you know, in their words, you knew whose cow gave you that milk, you knew so-and-so was sick, everybody took that person food, you knew where the chickens were, if there was a, a random chicken on the street, you knew whose chicken it was. Everything was very um, tightly knit and, uh, and a supportive community. And then, you know, someone died and then someone got divorced and then someone had to pay ta death taxes and everything started to break down and the village got sold off. So everything got chopped off and chopped up and sold off. So they said what happened then was that people from the city would buy up properties in the village but not live in them. So they bought them as weekenders or holiday houses. But because they weren't living in those houses, it meant that the village itself had started to break down in the sense that there weren't enough people there anymore to keep it as a sustaining, a sustainable village. So people who lived there now had to go further and further afield to find work. Um, house prices actually increased though because people wanted them from the city and then people who wanted to live there couldn't afford to live there. And so it just became this sort of really um, sort of empty village. And indeed, when we were walking around the village, we could see, you know, building after building after building that was empty. So it's ironic because it's such a beautiful part of the world and it's one so sought after by, you know, filmmakers and um, travel shows and buses would come through and everybody would gaze at these beautiful buildings and landscapes and take photos. But there was actually no sort of beating heart. It was like a museum for these um, buildings. So their sadness really touched me. And I went back to my cottage with my, <laughs> with my little notebook and I started making um, notes in here saying, you know, how can I bring this village back to life? I was sure there was some way that I could do that, even if it was on the page. And I didn't really know what I was going to do, um, but I kept sort of, you know, I like to just, I like to just make things happen. I often say that I just write stories, like I give people jobs that I would like to have. And so in this instance, I wanted to create a village that I would like to live in. So that was my um, goal was to get all that back together. So I thought I would show you um, a few photos. This is a very old school. Tracy said to me, oh, are you, are you gonna share screens and split screens? I'm just not that technical, I'm afraid. So this is old school. So this is a photo of uh, me, obviously in the center, taking a photo of my dad and my sister. And the reason we look so happy is because uh, we're Australian and so it's not normal for us to walk down a little laneway and stumble across what looks like Downton Abbey in the back there which is exactly what it looked like we sort of turned this corner and went oh, is that actually Downton Abbey and it was you know and Downton Abbey was at its height of you know glory and it was just such a stunning thing to see this you know this building that was just hundreds and hundreds of years old just kind of sitting out there um, for anyone to wander past. And that uh, manor house, if you have read the book, that manor house then became the inspiration for uh, the manor house in the village as well, which becomes a scene of uh, some important meetings and some important big events. So I do like to, when I do, um, when I do location research, as I said, I will put real streets, real buildings, real um, shops, in the stories, if sometimes I change the names, but I do as much as possible. I think you can't do better than what's already there. So I'll take those real things and give them a new life on the page as well. So that was us wandering around in the Cotswolds. That was another, just um, kind of the back end of the manor house, all the ivy, it's very iconic, all that ivy growing over those stone buildings, very, very beautiful. And there's certainly, um, yeah, the ivy in there as well. And there was a beautiful river running through the village and this, um, you know, this, oh, this, build, this bridge that was just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, just all made out of stone, which is why I ended up calling the village Stoneden because 
if you've been to the Cotswolds, you know that there's just so much stone everywhere. Everything's built out of stone. And it's, it's mind-boggling to understand where it all came from, how long it must have taken to build it all, how this was all done by hand when we didn't have, you know, jackhammers and, and things like this and, you know, and sheep. And you, I mean, you see this in Ireland too, and all the you know, sheep fencing is all made of stone and it's just, just blows my mind completely. And this I printed out for you is, these are the apples that were growing in the backyard of the cottage we were staying in. And when we went out the back, there was this little um, short row of bushes. And for me, this was extreme, and they had apples on them. So for me, this was really, really exciting for a couple of reasons. One, because I just love apples and um, anything that's got apple in it, I'll happily eat it. I just love it, love it, love it. Two, because I am a Queenslander and a subtropical Queenslander, we don't have apple trees up here. So I've never seen one in real life. Um, there's a tiny pocket in Queensland called Stanthorpe. Uh, I've never been there. It's very cold. It probably snowed there quite recently. It's a kind of a little anomaly in Queensland, but they have apples. But otherwise, certainly in subtropical Queensland, there's no apples. So it was really, really exciting. So I, and then all these apples were in, you know, lying all over the ground. So being an apple lover, having all these apples on the ground, I ran around and picked up all the apples and took them inside and proceeded to make apple crumble. And uh, my dad and my sister and I ate all the apple crumble and we made another one and we uh, ate it with cream and then we ran out of the cream. And so we kept eating it with the Baileys and you know, it was great. We're having a wonderful time. And it was about a week later that I was speaking to the same woman who'd said, you know, you should speak to Terry and Brian. Uh, and I was saying, oh, I'm having such a great time with these apples. And she said, oh, they're your neighbour's apples. And I said, oh, oh, sorry, they were just like in the back, literally in the backyard. And she goes, no, 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 you can't have them. And I just thought that was so it's outside of my experience, you know, my experience of fruit is on the lawn in your backyard, that's your fruit. But I also just thought that's brilliant. You know, it was obviously such a no, no in that location and in that particular neighborhood that um, I just thought, I just tucked that away. Cause I thought oh, that's such a great uh, point of contention for a new neighbor, just to have something so simple, such a simple little mistake and have it go, you know, so wrong from there. There was also at the back of our, um, or just down the hill from where we were staying, uh, a laneway that led to, um, this is my dad, obviously, obviously I'm taking all the photos, which is why I'm hardly in any of them. Um, anyway, the, this laneway led to this great big long public access walk. And so we decided to go out there, baby in the pram, the whole deal. And um, we walked for kilometres and we didn't think we'd be walking that far. But we and we got rained on and it was cold and we just we got really lost there for a bit and we didn't know what to do and there was a sort of moment where we were sitting down on a big log and it was raining on us and we really didn't know where we were and we had no idea how far we would have to go and we were like should we turn back we've already been walking kilometers should we turn backwards should we keep going which way will we go um and it was it was stressful and it was a bit scary, but of course it's one of those adventures that becomes such a great, oh, wasn't that great? You know, in hindsight, you hear what a great walk, what a great thing. Um, and that, if you've read the book too, that sort of walk is in the story as well, where Olivia goes on a walk with um, a local farmer called Grayson and they get a bit lost in the rain and um, yeah, some exciting little adventures happen to them there as well. So that is a little bit about uh, me and about the book and that was a reading. Um, so what else did I want to tell you? I just have a look at my little notes here. Um, people often ask me about food in my books and why I write about food and how I choose my food and all, all of that sort of stuff. So food for me uh, started with the teacher. So when I published the tea chest it was actually the 10th manuscript I'd written uh, in about 12 years and I had been writing for those 12 years across many many different genres so I was writing fiction I was writing non-fiction I was writing 
memoir and I was writing children's and I was doing all sorts of stuff. And one day I looked at what I was reading and I thought, and I kept getting, the point is, I kept getting so close to publication. I kept getting so close and just not getting there. And I really didn't know, you know, what was going wrong. And one day I thought, I really should look at what I'm reading. Maybe I should be writing in the genres that I'm reading. And what I was reading were novels from the likes of Monica McEnany and Jojo Moyes and Leah Moriarty and um, uh, Marion Keys and those kinds of writers. So I thought, well, I'll have a go at writing in that style. And I also loved tea. I still love tea. I'm a huge tea drinker. And I was in a tea two shop one day and I was sniffing all little bowls of tea. And I just, it suddenly occurred to me that it was someone's job to design tea, to tea, make tea blends. And I thought, this is brilliant. This is, what a great job this is. And because I couldn't have that job myself, I thought, well, I'll create a character who can have that job. And so I came up with the tea chest. And um, when that book was published, it, it was picked up and published quite quickly. And I was given a two book deal. And so I needed to write a new book. <laughs> so I looked at what I had written and I thought, well, I really enjoyed writing about all that tea and, um, you know, I very much, I made tea. I picked things out of my garden and made pots of tea and I drank lots of tea and I took lots of notes and I researched it. It was great fun. I really, really enjoyed it. And I thought I really, really love that. Maybe I should continue with this food theme. And so the next one I looked at was chocolate because why wouldn't you write about chocolate? Can you imagine the research, right? I literally imported chocolate from overseas and claimed it as a tax deduction because it was, it was right of research. Dead set. Absolutely. What a great job. So when that happened, um, when the teachers was going out, we were looking for, I was looking for a way to, you know, sort of differentiate it from what was out there in, um, in the rest of the book market. And so it came up with this term of foodie fiction. Um, because the, the fiction story itself was so interwoven with the food themes and that was what I wanted to keep doing. And it's taken many years for that foodie fiction, foodie lit kind of term to catch on, but it's finally, finally getting there with um, Cake Maker's Wish being my sixth foodie fiction book out there. But I, you know, I love research. Research for me is such a huge part of my work and it's my most enjoyable part of what I do as well. I can spend a long time in research and get really lost in there. And when you write about food, you have to do a lot of research with food, right? It's huge fun. So when I did the chocolate book, I thought, well, I need to know how to make chocolate. So I went and enrolled myself in a chocolate making course. And um, I took my sister with me because I, t I take my sister with me everywhere when I do research. She's great value and great fun. And she makes sure that I get on the right plane at the right time, which is hugely helpful. And um, so I went to learn to make chocolate. And when I did the beekeeper's secret, uh, it took me a while to find a good beekeeper, but I found a good beekeeper who could teach me about bees and take me out to see her bees and let me open the hives and have a look. And um, when I did, um, I'm blank on my book's name now, The Gift of Life with the coffee, I went and found a great coffee roaster uh, in Noosa who was fabulous and invited me in and you know they showed me how to roast beans and how to cup coffee and told me great stories um, you know behind the scenes stories again people being your best possible value for, re for research as a resource and uh, so I like to be really really hands-on so I call myself a method writer so just like actors call themselves method actors when they're researching a role they like to go and actually sort of do that role I feel the same with my characters and especially with the food I really really need to get my hands in it I need to know what it looks like smells like how it feels all the things that can go wrong all the things that go right um, and stuff like that so for the cake book I started out by interviewing um, Katie from my local cake who's my local local cake maker uh, here in Karoi and she has a business called Buttercups Cup cupcakes and I've had many cakes from her over the years and she makes does beautiful beautiful work and um, so she was great and so I, I interviewed her and you know I just to sort of know things like well what is the rhythm of your day like like what time do you have to get up and how 
how long does it take to do this? And, um, you know, from a book perspective, I'm really interested in what can go wrong and, um, you know, those sort of stress points that you could possibly bring into a business. How could somebody sabotage a business, for example? I asked her that. <laughs> and um, because they're, that's all giving me potential plot um, points that I can use in my story. And um, one thing that stuck with me, though, was I said to her, she was talking about this, you know, these big, big, big sort of weddings and really, um, in, I guess, days where, well, mostly weddings, really, where people, you know, you've really only got one chance to get that thing right and get it delivered and be there on time, which to me sounds really stressful. And I said, do you ever get nervous and doing that? And she said, no, never, because you just... That for her is the easy stuff. You know, that's, she knows her craft. She knows it really well. And that really, really stuck with me. And I, I wanted to give that uh, quality to Olivia, my main character. So through the book, you'll really see her in there. You know, there's a lot of baking in this book. So be warned. It would be helpful to have some cake or biscuits at least around the place because I am told that it makes people very, very hungry. So Olivia is doing a lot of baking in this book. And um, so while a lot of things in her life are going wrong and there's a lot of yeah it's just a lot of you know dynamics and potential potential chaos going around her the thing that holds her together the whole way through that book is that she knows her craft she can rely on her craft and she knows it's going to get her through in the end and that's the kind of thing that i look for you know when I'm doing an interview with somebody for research, I'm looking for those, those little character things that I think, wow, that's great. I can really use that as um, a building block for my character. Then, of course, I wanted to actually make cakes. Now, everybody makes, most people, no, I can't say everybody, but most people make cakes, make biscuits, make scones. Um, so, you know, most of us have some kind of baking level of skill, but I did want to up my skill level for this book as well. So I wanted to teach myself how to learn, you know, to pipe icing, for example, or um, just something like that. And so uh, I did actually enter a cake into the Nusa show. And I did, because I'm gluten-free, I did a gluten-free Persian love cake and it got second place. How's that? First time I ever entered a cake in a show. That was a bit exciting. And the Persian love cake is, um, uh, an important cake in the book and I have put the recipe for this particular second place winning cake in the back of the book as well so if you're into recipes in your books there is one there in the back of the book for you to have a go at and that cake is such a great cake and it's um I've pulled it out many 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 times of late for birthdays and all sorts of things or just for fun cakes one day I was just having a bad day so I called my mum and said do you want to come over for coffee and cake? And I'm going to make a Persian love cake. And you know what? The day got a lot better after that. It was really good. A couple of tricky things happened when writing the book. I'm just referring to my notes because uh, I don't want to get too lost. I'm keeping a bit of an eye on the time there too. Two things really stand out for me in terms of trickiness for this book. Number one was that I started writing the book in 2015 when I came back from the Cotswolds. I got halfway through a first draft, which is 50,000 words, which is a lot of words and a lot of time because I'm a very, very slow writer. I invariably take about six months to write a first draft of all my books, which is really slow if you're doing a book a year uh, because you, yeah, it's just a very, very slow period of time. And they do overlap a little bit. It's not like you do one and nothing else. They do, you sort of put one aside and then you edit the one, you know, and it moves on it. They, sh they shuffle on and off your desk a bit, but six months easily. So say three months worth of work, 50,000 words, and it wasn't working. And I thought, this is terrible. I, just, I don't know what's wrong with this book. I sent it to Clara, who's my favourite editor, and said, can you please read this? Can you tell me what's gone wrong? What has happened? And she wrote me a lot of notes, and she didn't actually tell me what she thought was wrong with it. She just highlighted, well, this is going on here, and this is going on here. And I'm not sure you can sustain this if this is going on here. And I realised from reading her notes that I had to let the whole thing go, which was a horrible moment to fully accept that I had to just let go of 50,000 words, three months worth of work, and just, it just wasn't good enough. <coughs> so I did what any 
sensible writer would do. And I got on a plane and went to Italy. And while I was in Italy on writing retreat, I discovered a new story. Now, if you have read Three Gold Coins, you will know that it is set in Italy. And it begins with Lara Foxley landing in Rome and meeting an elderly man who needs her help. Now, my first draft of this Cotswolds book, I had the Foxley sisters and the children, the Foxley kids, in Stoneden, in this village. And uh, things were going, it was a different plot line. There were things were going wrong there. And I think one of the things that made me realise that I couldn't sustain the book was that there was sort of this very serious element of what was going on with the Foxley sisters. And then there was all this light and joy and greatness going on here in the village. And I think this was one of the things Clara sort of mentioned too, was like, uh, it's just this sort of incongruent level of tone. So I took the Foxley sisters out of the Cotswolds book and I put them in three gold coins and then they had their own story over there. And then years later, I realized what had been wrong with my first draft of the Cotswolds book, which was that I had two separate novels going on in the one story. So once I'd pulled the Foxleys out and put them somewhere else, I still had left this great little village. I had all the supporting characters there. I had the setting, I had the premise, I had, you know, the Renaissance project, this, this experimental project it was all there and it was waiting for a new hero. So basically I parachuted in a new hero in the form of Olivia and her young son Darcy. And that's where we get The Cake Maker's Wish, which is a completely different book to Three Gold Coins. Um, and The Cake Maker's Wish is just so full of light and love and warmth and joy and fun. There's, you know, some drama in there, of course there is, that I wouldn't be a book if there wasn't, but it is just, um, you know, I was worried about it coming out during the time of COVID. And then I realized that actually this book had been waiting for this moment. I think a lot of books, you know, they find their perfect time to come out into the world. And this book, I think, really waited for the right moment to come out. So I'm really, really pleased that it did. The other tricky thing I will tell you about before we go to Tracy and the questions is um, a funny thing happened writing this book in that uh, I knew that Olivia was going to have some kind of romance going on in the village. Uh, and I thought I knew who that person was. And so I started writing the story and this will give you some idea of my chaotic way of writing. Um, I started writing the story and then somewhere along the line, a second man put up his hand and went, I want to be with Olivia too. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Now I have two guys in the mix. This has never happened to me before. And um, so I sort of started playing with that. And then a little bit later, a third man put up his hand and went, hang on a minute, I want to be with Olivia. And so now I had three men who all wanted to be with Olivia. So things got pretty wild there for a bit and very confusing. And I thought I knew who should end up with Olivia. And my early drafts had them together. And both my publisher and my editor said, I don't think she's with the right man. And I thought, what are you talking about? I love Harry. Harry's great. And they didn't tell me what to do. And I went away and thought about it. And for me, characters often just turn up in books. I don't plan them. They just literally walk into a scene, which is what happened to Harry. And after a while, I realised what had happened was that Harry had walked into the wrong book. So Harry doesn't belong in The Cake Maker's Wish. Harry belonged in next year's book. So then I had to go and pull Harry out from page one to the last page. And every scene, every, everything, it just, you know, it's a massive rewrite when you do something like that. But it was worth it because now Harry is where he should be, which is in next week's, next year's book, currently called The Jam Queen. And Olivia is with the man she's supposed to be with in the Cotswolds. But yeah, that got a bit confusing <laughs> and a bit crazy there for a bit. So that's a little bit of a journey of the Cake Maker's Wish for you. And I would love to invite Tracy in now to bring up some of these questions that you guys have asked and I will do my absolute best to answer them. And if you're still here, thank you for listening this, uh, this far.
Great. Thank you, Josephine. Yeah, we're here. We're all listening <laughs> wrapped. We're all fascinated, I'm sure, by your method writing process, which is fascinating and potentially fattening, making all those delicious cakes. And congratulations on second place in the show. Thank your you. Persian love cake. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions here. So uh, what was the publishing process like? Brittany would like to know. For this book or do you mean how I got into publishing? Uh, I'm assuming she means this book, but we can hear about how you got into there in the first place as well, if you like. Um, so in terms of how I broke into publishing, that uh, happened over a lot of years. As, as I said, I wrote for 12 years and I started writing uh, back in 1999. So the internet was barely sort of around. Everything was still very manual. You literally had to print out manuscripts this big and post them off and then with reply paid you know envelopes for them to come back and it was all very 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 slow I mean it's still very slow publishing is a very slow business but you know it was very different then and uh, so I just did that I wrote short stories for a really really long time and I can't recommend that enough if you're an emerging or beginning writer to hone your craft and really find your voice because I think it takes a long time to really find your voice as a writer and um, I know it certainly did for me, which is why it took me so long to write the T-Chess because I didn't know what I was, you know, I didn't know what I, what I was doing, where my voice was settling until I wrote that book. Um, and I entered lots and lots of competitions. I was rejected. I kept a spreadsheet. I was rejected at least 100 times, uh, which sounds really bad. And it is bad and it's depressing. But remember, that was over 12 years. So it's less than 10 a year. So it's not quite as bad as it sounds although it certainly felt bad. Um, but when it got to 100, I just went, oh, that's depressing. And I deleted the spreadsheet. And then um, basically I got an introduction to an agent via another author. And that agent became my agent and then the book was sold. And that is a very, um, that's a very typical way that people break in because it's, it's very, it is a very hard business to crack into. Uh, but that is a, quite a typical way to break in. Awesome. Um, Amanda would like to know how long do you take to research and then write a manuscript that you are happy to submit to your publishers? <laughs> um, research, um, it's, it's a hard thing to quantify because it kind of goes on for a while. So I'll do a deep dive into research. Uh, and, you know, Phil, I always start every book that I write has a notebook just for that book. And so I'll try and keep all my notes in the one place. Uh, inevitably, they get a few recipes thrown in there or a few phone numbers or something. But, you know, I try and keep everything in one spot. I don't know. It's, it's a hard one because I will start, like I'm already researching. I've just bought a notebook to start researching the book that, that would be published if I was still doing a book a year in 2022. So I guess I start thinking and sort of making notes and doing a bit of research two years out. And then when I get a bit more serious and then I might book, you know, a research trip and that might ha happen um, a year and a half out. And yeah, so it kind of, it kind of goes, but it goes in chunks really. That's the best way I can describe that. So it will be chunks. It might be a two week research trip if I'm lucky, it might be a weekend. Um, and then I will top up as I need. So if I get stuck or I need a new scene that I haven't yet researched, then I have to top up. So it's kind of, yeah, it's on an as-need basis. Uh, and what was the other half of that question? How Sorry. long to write? Uh, was it how many drafts or something? Yeah, I just think um, till you're ready and happy to submit to your publishers. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm kind of never happy to submit it, <laughs> really. I'd like to keep it forever. Um, but if you're on a book a year contract, which, again, is really fast, um, you, you just don't have the luxury. I don't have the luxury anymore of having as much time as I used to. The upside to that, I guess, is that I hopefully am getting better at what I do. And so it's not quite as bad. Although, honestly, I end up, re I end up rewriting every book I write. So I, I clearly, it's just the way I work. It's quite chaotic. Um, and I also have now, I guess in the past, like years and years ago, I would have writing buddies and then, you know, I would get feedback and that's a much lengthier process than just saying, giving it to my publisher and saying, can you please tell me what you think? 
and I'll get very accurate feedback, which makes my redrafting a bit faster. So what can I say? It's kind of, if you're on a book a year, you just sort of um, getting it in as fast as possible, basically. That makes sense. Um, so Fleur McDonald, now I'm assuming that is Fleur McDonald that is there with us this evening, who is joining us in November, might I add. So hi, Fleur. Uh, she says pulling a character out would have been horrendous and was it crazily difficult? It wasn't fun, Fleur. It was not fun at all. Um, I went on retreat and uh, I go on a retreat twice a year for three nights with a good friend of mine, Kate, who is a great writer as well. And um, I did a lot of that on retreat of just, and there was a lot of groaning. I'd <laughs> get to a point and I'd go, oh, and Kate would say, what's wrong? And I'd say, oh, Harry's in another scene. Look, it just, it was just a matter of getting it done. It was not fun at all. Um, but you know, the, oh, it felt so awful at the time. And to be honest, I actually kind of wanted to quit during that time. It was just so nasty. But at the same time, I also had pneumonia. So I think I was, you know, my reserves were very low. And so I was not in a good state to kind of deal with it. But it got there and the book is so much better. And this is what you have to learn as a writer. Every book is so unique. Every book is, has its own challenges. And every time I think, I can't do this. This is terrible. I can't get through this. I just have to remind myself that I've done it before. I've done it with every single book that I've written. I've done it before and you'll do it again. And that's it's just what you have to do to get the best book out in the world. And if you're a messy writer as I am, you just have to learn to clean up the mess, I think. And focus on the gift that Harry is a great character. He was just in the rock book. So I had great fun putting him in the Jam Queen, which is the current title of next year's book. Awesome. So that leads into the next question because somebody had asked, how long did it take you to write this book and what are you working on next? Can you give us some hints and a little delve into the Jam Queen? Well, so for this book, as I said, started in 2015 and um, it didn't go off to the printers until January this year. So that was, you know, nearly five years um, with big breaks in between while I wrote other things and I stewed or marinated on this one. And the Jam Queen is, well, it follows a family of Jam Queens. So uh, they, they live in Barossa Valley and they go on, it's hard because it probably will change a lot, but oh, this won't change. They've got, they go on the GAN. So the great rail train that goes, um, trip, rail train trip that goes from Darwin down to Adelaide. Uh, again, I dragged my sister along, said, come on the GAN with me. I want to do research for a book. So, uh, you know, half the book is set on the GAN and again, huge fun. It's such a great, this is, honestly, this is the best perk of being a writer is research. <laughs> research trips are just so great and so much fun. So, um, yeah, so there's a big, it's a bit of family drama, basically. It's a family drama of, with jam queens and it's um, jam queens on the GAN. That's all I can really say about that one <laughs> right now. <laughs> Sounds awesome. And I hope you'll come and visit us in person when you've got that one out. Oh, that wouldn't that be great? That'd be great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So another question, what is your writing process like and what advice do you have for writers? So my writing process has changed every year. So I, I got my agent when my son was six weeks old and, um, and then quickly sold a two book deal. So Everything was very chaotic there for a few years and it was really intense and I'm really glad I'm through that and I don't ever want to write books under those circumstances again. Um, so it has always changed. It's changed, you know, when he was really little, it changed depending on when I could get somebody to look after him, how much sleep I'd had, who was in the house. We were also renovating a house at the time and I mean a full renovation, like restumping, taking out walls the whole deal new bathroom new kitchen all of it so it was a really mad time um now it's settled thankfully now that he's at school so i try and preserve the first four hours so it's at 9 a.m to 1 p.m as sort of my what i would call my golden window hours and i will try and do as much work as i can in those hours i mean things go wrong all the time you know as life does it you know throw a spanner in the works all over the place but I try and preserve those hours and that's, that's, that's kind of the bedrock of my routine. And as for um, advice, 
as I think I said before, hugely recommend spending. I think I think too many people jump from not being a writer into trying to write a novel, and to me, that's like trying to build a house when you haven't yet pitched a tent. So I always say, spend time developing your craft on short stories because you don't have to invest a lot of time in a short story and you can really get through a lot of different genres write everything write romance write mystery write crime write fantasy write anything and everything and a thousand word story or a three thousand word story you can knock that out in a day if you really want to or certainly in a week it's just not that much time but the skill you're developing while doing it is teaching you about story it's teaching you about arc it's teaching you about your voice so invest just don't jump into the novel straight away. Really spend some time developing your craft first. That's great advice. Um, just one more question, I think, for tonight before we run out of time, unfortunately. Um, out of the six books you've written, do you have a particular favourite and why? So everyone, someone always asks me that every, question, every, um, every time I speak. Uh, it's, it's a great question. I, books are like children, so they're all different and I love them all equally. So I have to confess to having a small soft spot for the beekeeper's secret and which is a mystery set here on the Sunshine Coast. And I think mostly because one, it was an easy book to write. It was, it was a gift of a book. Um, Maria, the main character sort of turned up really uh, easily and vocally and had a lot to say. And, and so it was a fast write, well, four months for me, which is fast. And um, I don't know. She just she's a, she's such a strong character. I just love her a lot. So yeah, I have a soft spot for that book. And of course, of course, right now this is absolutely my favorite book. This is my current baby, so it's the best baby right now. <laughs> of course, and that cover does look delicious. I can see why people would like to lick that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Josephine, for joining us this evening. Um, we don't have any more questions yeah. from our listeners, but it has been uh, a joy having you with us tonight. And uh, your room there also looks gorgeous as well. So thank you. Hope to see you coming out, beaming out of that room a lot more. Oh, um, lovely. Josephine's books can be found at your local bookstore. So please shop and support local. And please keep following the Marion Library's Facebook page, the City of Marion website, and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming Library Through the Lens presentations on work and workshops. And we look forward to having you join us again, Josephine, like I said, with your next book, uh, hopefully Thank in person. Lovely. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a great, it's been great fun. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Cheers.